afternoon. Welcome to Information Matters. This is an occasional lecture series sponsored by the Smithsonian Institution Library, Smithsonian Institution Archives, and the Office of the Chief Information Officer here at Smithsonian. This is a series that's designed to bring in speakers to address some of the current issues we face together as information professionals. Today we're webcasting this presentation, so I want to welcome not only you people in the room, but also people across the Smithsonian and around the world who are listening in to this session today. So I'm Ann Van Camp. I'm the director of the Smithsonian Institution Archives. And it's my pleasure to the, today to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Margaret Hedstrom. Margaret is the Robert M. Warner Collegiate Professor of Information at the University of Michigan, where she teaches in the areas of archives, collective memory, and digital curation. Her career, accomplishments, and achievements in the information space and in the archival profession are extraordinary and extensive. There's a really nice summary that was included in the lecture announcement. And if you wish to visit her on Google, you can find her Wikipedia page and over nine pages of citation information. So I will not attempt to repeat all of that here. I'll just say that Margaret has spent her entire career looking at some of the most difficult issues surrounding the preservation of electronic records, digital information, and in teaching other professionals how to explore these problems as well. So today, Margaret is going to try to help us understand some of the complexities of digital curation and what that means to us as information professionals grappling with data management, long-term preservation of digital information, and all the other host of issues that keep us up at night. So please join me in welcoming my, my long-term friend and colleague, Margaret Hedstrom. Well, I'd like to begin by thanking Anne for that wonderful introduction. And I'd also like to thank Nancy Gwynn for the invitation to come and talk today. And I want to thank all of you, those who are here uh, physically and those who are here virtually, for uh, taking some time off this afternoon um, to hear a little bit about digital curation uh, education and training. Uh, I uh, chaired a study committee for the National Academy, uh, Academies um, under the Board of Research Data and Information, which produced a report in 2015 called Preparing the Workforce for Digital Curation. Uh, that was sponsored uh, primarily by the Institute for Museum and Library S Services. And I uh, will draw a little bit on that experience, but I want to make it clear that what I'm going to be talking about today is really my position and um, kind of my looking back at what I've been doing for the last 10 years or so in the area of digital curation. And what I've been doing during that time period is working uh, embedding myself, really, in a number of projects across several different scientific disciplines to try to get a better sense of how it is that we could engage people who are producing data in the process of managing it better, making it more valuable, and perhaps making it easier for repositories, archives, libraries, museums, and other institutions to actually preserve. So um, I have had the great fortune over the last year to be on sabbatical, which has also given me a lot of time to reflect on some of these experiences. Um, and so if some of my talking seems a bit like a stream of consciousness, it's because you may be the first audience that I'm trying out some of these new ideas on. Uh, I would just also, to say a little bit more about some of the environments that I've been working with, um, 
I've had funding, two large uh, projects funded by the National Science Foundation. One was um, called an IGERT, it's a NSF traineeship for PhD students that is interdisciplinary and you sort of integrate the training in whatever the IGERT is about <laughs> with their graduate education. Um, I had an IGERT called Open Data and it was about uh, how to get uh, doctoral students engaged in and aware of uh, what is necessary in order to share data and to open up data for others to reuse. That involved um, researchers and PhD students in computer science, in materials science and engineering, in chemical engineering, and in bioinformatics, as well as in inf information um, and with a f more of a focus on curation. So that was a broad spectrum of disciplines. Um, I've also been the PI on a, an NSF award called SEED, where we have been working with the um, sustainability science community on making it easier to move data from active research into repositories. Uh, and that community has involved environmental scientists, ecologists, hydrologists, people doing experiments with, with soils and sediments. And so there's you know, quite a broad, again, but different representation there. Uh, I work quite a bit with social science scientists. I'm affiliated, besides with the School of Information, with the in, um, the Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Research at the University of Michigan, which is the large social science data archive. And I myself am trained as a historian and I'm starting to do a little bit of work in digital humanities. Um, and so my perspectives are really coming from trying out some of the various proposals and ideas that we've had about engaging researchers earlier in the life cycle and getting them aware of and um, working on digital curation. And, and so that's, that's kind of the framework of, of where I'm coming from. I wanna just say quickly that um, in the, uh, the committee that produced the report for um, the National Academies, the, that preparing the workforce for digital curation, which was composed of, uh, again, some active researchers as well as people in information schools and uh, a few people from industry who were all concerned about curation. Um, we developed a definition that's pretty broad. And um, the, the and I'm going to use that as kind of the basis of what do we mean by digital curation. Um, it's the active management of data. So digital curation is not something that starts when somebody's finished off with their project or their data and they say, ooh, I gotta do something with this stuff. Here, take it and figure out how to curate it. It's active management that is planned, systematic, purposeful, and directed actions that make the data fit for a purpose. Now, what I think is important to understand is that when we have talked about active management to improve curation, we haven't paid enough attention to how will that make that data more valuable and more useful to the people who are creating it and analyzing it in the first place? And I will get to that more of that later. Um, enhancement, making data more valuable for both current and future use. That is an important piece of curation, that you're adding value to it either for its immediate use or perhaps for some future use. We um, 
used a broad definition of digital information assets. So, you know, any information deemed to have value and that could run the spectrum from retrospectively digitized content to, you know, streaming media. Most of what my experience uh, has been recently with research data in, in the sciences and social sciences, and that will really be the focus that I'm going to be drawing on today. Um, and then current and future use. So we're, we're not um, curating simply because we need to do it or you have to curate data in order to put it somewhere and be able to get it back later and understand it. We ha we're curating for current use in an original or new context um, for the original purpose or perhaps for a different purpose now or later. And that is a very big ball of wax. It's a huge order and one, my probably main point is we can't do that with a single solution. <laughs> um, and, or we will never get anywhere. So um, with that broad definition of digital curation in mind, I think the important thing that we need to work on next in terms of what we teach people to do and how and why is looking at what are our expect expectations about roles and responsibilities um, in for curation. So I think we have a we've we've used to some extent the notion of the information life cycle to think about curation along that life cycle where the people or, or groups or entities that are producing data have a certain set of responsibilities and later in the life cycle a curator steps in and takes responsibility for the additional actions that are necessary to make the data accessible, understandable, and useful, and to um, make sure that it persists for as long as it's needed. And so we have this sort of, well, the, they're data producers, they collect and they create data and they clean it up and they check it for accuracy and they look and make sure it's of good quality and they document, uh, they store it securely. And I want to say those are all tasks that are in their own interest. They need to do that to do their research or to carry out their business responsibilities. Um, and then we may ask them, could they also provide some more documentation uh, of how they got the data and how, how the data works and how they analyze the data. That may or may not help them. We have to think about that. And then submit the data to an archive. Um, the assumption is that there's kind of a smooth flow and that all takes place. And then the curator accepts the data checks it for quality, goes back and negotiates and may ask for more documentation or more information. We add metadata to it. We put it in some kind of package according to some set of standards and provide access to the data. Um, and that's all well and good, but there are some problems and issues with this pro with this model in, um, in its implementation and in the messiness of the real world. And one of them is that we would love for, as you know, curators, we'd love to get scientists thinking about how can I structure my data to make it easier to preserve? Let me get all this metadata together that somebody wants for me. Um, I'm gonna, you know, put it into these accepted formats and submit it to the archive. And then your, our life, if they do all that, our life will be easier. The bottom line is that 
for the most part, scientists don't do that. And not to be, um, let's see, not to make you feel worse than you might already about the challenges of digital curation, I'm going to say in many instances they won't and they never will <laughs> um, because their job is to do research, to publish papers, to have an impact, to do analysis um, and they aren't in the curation business so uh, we have to keep that in mind. And what that means for us on the curation side is that we have to be prepared for the fact that, hey, things are going to be messier than we would like. And so how do we build up the capacity to deal with data, not totally as it's provided to us. We don't have to say anything goes, you know, just give us your junk. but. Um, we have to be much more flexible in, in my view about um, what level of investment we make in curation and um, what we're willing to do. And I'm going to say a bit more about, about this um, in a couple minutes. Uh, an important part of the reason that I have come to the conclusion that there's a big chasm here is that but we know a fair amount, we have very widely varying estimates of how much does curation cost. Um, we know how much it costs to store things. We know a little bit about how much it costs to do some kind of analysis. We might know a little bit about how much it costs to add certain amounts of metadata. Um, but we don't, but the one thing that we know pretty universally of every cost study that's been done is that the biggest cost is getting the data from its production environment into a repository. And that is very frictionful. I mean, it's full of friction. It involves effort to translate that data into whatever standards a repository might have. It's the adding the metadata, it's the quality control, the reformatting, and all of that. Um, what we, and that is without very little, if any, accounting for how much effort does it take on the part of researchers to get their data into a form where they can even submit it. So I'm going to um, spend most of my time, the rest of the time, talking about this this spectrum of engagement and interest and um, capabilities and readiness for different communities at, who are at different stages of development with regard to data use and data analysis and data curation to um, engage and really care about and perhaps do something about their data. Um, I want to just add that um, what it's important, sorry, from an educational point of view, it's, it's really important, I think, to put your, yourself in the shoes of the researchers or the scientific community or the business community or the arts community or whoever it is that is producing the digital information and um, their kind of mindset and interest. And with this broad definition of digital curation, and one of the things we just sort of talk about in the report from the, the committee is that there's this whole spectrum of digital curation jobs. There isn't, in fact, there are a few jobs called digital curator, but there are many more people involved in some aspect of curation where they don't have that job title, and in fact, they only intermittently do something for curation. They, they might write a data management plan 
for example, is part of a grant proposal. And then they get the grant proposal, they might shake off the data management plan and say what they were supposed to do about that, and then three years goes by and the grant ends and it's like, oh, this is what I was supposed to, I said I would do with my data, you know. Um, they're, they're just not thinking about it on an everyday basis and quite frankly, there's no reason for them to. So we have people engaged just, you know, every once in a while or sometimes after some sort of disaster or after someone, you know, they publish a paper, they have some data, someone calls them up on the phone and asks them a question about it. You know, you might think about that, the curation a little bit. And so there's that spectrum. The, the other end are people like us who are interested, most of us I think, who are concerned about curation as, you know, our day job. And um, thinking about ways to organize activities and to, um, you know, really focus on what the curation challenges are. And at the same time, you know, along that spectrum, we need different types of knowledge. And I, the, the point of this is that if you have a domain scientist, you know, they're really good at doing their science. It could be, you know, material, developing new materials. It could be sequencing genes and or discovering protein interactions. It could be um, looking at environmental threats to a particular species. It could be understanding um, reasons for particular income gaps in their relationship to health outcomes. I mean, you name it. That's what domain scientists do. Um, and they, you know, they have a lot of that kind of knowledge. The, on the other end of the, the other end of the spectrum is a whole set of curation knowledge that people who mainly focus on curation do. And there's, you know, a lot of kinds of positions in between. Um, my point is that we do not want to take good domain scientists and make them into really crappy curators. And we don't want to have curators who actually have the audacity to think that they're going to go out and sequence genes. So what we have to figure out is, you know, what, what, it, what are the roles and responsibilities across this spectrum? And, and how do we deliver education and training in ways that are effective relative to the time and effort and benefit and amount of attention that people are willing to pay to it? Okay. So I'm going to say, looking at, I guess, my, my current model or thinking about this, if we're focusing on what kind of education and training do curation professionals need. I would define this notion of curation knowledge pretty broadly, but that it, what, that it really has three dimensions to it. One is a deep understanding of the production environment or production environments that the data is coming from. And that isn't necessarily just, a, you know, a scientific laboratory or a research project. Um, there are economists and sociologists and um, public health epidemiologists. There's all kinds of people mining things like Twitter data and uh, to use for their research. What is that production? environment about. So we need to, and I'll say a bit more about what, some of the aspects of this. What is the use and reuse environment like? You know, what are the people who are mining Twitter data trying to do with it? We have to understand that piece. And then the curation environment, which tends to be built around a set of policies, practices, institutional capabilities, and technologies. 
and I think the important thing to keep in mind is that um, when we think about these relationships, we have to really be clear about what aspects of curation are, are the producers in the particular environment you're working with willing and able to do to improve their data? Um, and what do they need to do in order to do their work better? And then on the use end, what level of curation do users really need? And so let me start by just saying a little bit about some things we ought to, if, if you're thinking about, okay, how can I work with this particular set of scientists or this set of people in my institution who are creating data and, you know, they may even come saying, I need help. How can we, you know, start to approach what kind of, um, services do we need to develop and you know what kind of training do they need and also what kind of training do we need so um there are things like you know what are their what's their critical business or research questions what are some of the common analytical methods they're using um i've learned a lot about just working with material scientists about the difference between people doing experiments and doing simulations and they might be looking at the same problem but they're using completely different approaches and analysis and um, types of data and it's all I mean to me it's all very interesting um, what and what are the sources and the types of data the common technologies um, and a really important thing I think for for us to understand in these different production environments is what are their own standards for precision, quality, and trust? There's been a lot of discussion in the scientific community about the importance of being able to replicate results. And replicating results is an incredibly difficult thing to do. If we raise the bar for all fields, or assume that because in some fields it is absolutely critical to represent, rec replicate results, therefore it must be true for all science or all research or all investigation, um, we are setting, we're taking our already big challenge and really making it intractable or more intractable, if that is even a concept. <laughs> um, so anyway, you know, we have to sort of understand that data for some fields and for some kinds of research questions doesn't have to be perfect. And somehow it's still acceptable and people learn things from it and the field moves forward. Um, how mature are the practices with regard to sharing and reuse? And, you know, what's the culture like? Are people collaborative? Are they cutthroat competing with each other? Um, are they secretive? Don't want anyone else to see what I, you know, the brilliant thing I just came up with. Uh, or let me tell the world what wonderful thing I just discovered. You know, that, that, that is an important um, kind of angle into whether or not data producers are going to be at all interested or concerned with um, the fate of their data. And, um, and then probably the most important thing here, how do they talk about it? How do they express their concerns? And um, that takes really active listening. I mean, sometimes when I've been in these exotic environments, I say, because I don't know anything about physics or lots of other fields. And, you know, it's like I listen to them and I, you know, I just don't say anything. I just have to cogitate on it for a while and try to figure out what, 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 would, what would, might work for them. Now, part of the reason I'm saying this about the producer environments is just that um, there's a lot of variation which is why one size fit all, fits all isn't going to work very well. And so, you know, 
I, I think librarians and archivists, we believe there is no problem that metadata won't solve or that couldn't be addressed with more metadata. Um, and what's important to recognize is that in the data community, in the scientific research community, sometimes metadata and standards are just like totally part of the workflow. You run an instrument, it downloads this, you know, it captures the calibrations, all the things, magical things that are going on, it puts a time and date stamp on it, blah, 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 to it's, you know, nobody has any, has any idea of what metadata should be there. Um, or there's a common vocabulary that defines a field and holds it together to, you know, the Tower of Babel. Um, there are variations from, as I said, we absolutely have to have replication to, replication is impossible. And I will say that, I'm, now I'm speaking as a historian, don't try to replicate the results of my PhD dissertation, for example. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, can't be done. And there are lots of fields like that. Um, we unfortunately can't go back and replicate the, the opinion polls about how people were gonna vote from last October because, you know, we know the election results now. So, um, that's, those are examples of this uh, variation in, in credibility. The maturity of the technology and applications, so there are places that have made big investments in hardware, software, instruments, interoperability, um, to, oh, I need a system, let me, you know, make my own, roll my own. And then, and, you know, for some scientists, you know, whether I curate data or not means everything. If I don't cure, if I, if I can't find, validate, replicate my results, get my hands on the data, you know, I'm out of a job or whatever, to no one cares, including me, so why should I bother? And, um, you know, these are really, imp I think, important factors in trying to um, size up the production environment. Um, likewise, I'll say in the reuse environment, which we do not know enough about in my view, um, is there a known interest or demand for reusable data in a, in a domain or a field? Or are we just saying, well, if we could get our hands on that data, it might be valuable to somebody for some reason sometime in the future. Um, what challenges do people face in finding data to reuse, in, in analyzing it, in understanding it. Who is the so-called designated community for the data that's being produced? In other words, who are the people who, who, who what, what's the set of researchers or users who understand the science and the methods and the data well enough to pick up somebody else's data and use it if it's got some minimal explanation. Um, if we can't satisfy people who are very closely related in time and purpose to reuse someone else's data, trying to satisfy some unknown person in the future to use it for something else is um, not likely to happen no matter how much metadata we attach to it. Um, and then can people outside this designated community understand and use the data? Now, just like uh, with the producer community, there are variations around, across user communities and you know, different scientific communities from, of course I'm going to reuse data um, I'm doing geology and of course I'm going to try to find the measurements that were taken of this particular phenomenon a hundred years ago and reuse them because what else is there to, you know, unless you go out and create your own new data, you're a slacker, right? Um, or the ability to reuse data. I mean, there clearly are fields um, 
quantitative social science where that's part of what people learn. Um, you're, it's, it's, it's not a sin to reanalyze data, looking at it from a different perspective, combining it with some other data. Um, the ability to assess data, like, you know, do people naively accept it at face value or are they willing to actually do some fairly complex analysis to look at the suitability and accuracy of the data? Um, and what do they need for infrastructure? Um, do they need a supercomputer? Does somebody have to build a new supercomputer for them to do their big data analysis of this humongous pile of stuff? Or, you know, are they somebody who's working with Excel? And, you know, what are their, again, what are their incentives to reuse data? I can't do my work. If I'm a historian, I can't do my work without reusing somebody else's, some data that somebody else created. So my life depends on it. But um, if one can easily reproduce or grab or substitute readily available data as opposed to going out and collecting their own, then, you know, you know why bother? So. Um, I want to, I'm going to skip over a couple things here because I want to say a bit more uh, about the implications of this for, for education and training. So um, what I think is most critical for educating people and training people to operate in the digital environment as curators um, are a number of high-level things, and I, you know, the specifics have to be shaped to the environment that one is working in. But I think that there is, you know, there clearly you need a deep underlying under, understanding of the underlying technical infrastructure. And by the technical infrastructure, I mean both the technical infrastructure of the your repository environment, how are you storing, what, what, what uh, services can you provide, what protocols do you use, what kind of data can you accept, uh, how are you going to deliver this and make it discoverable. And that's, that's a, a critical piece, but also the underlying um, infrastructure of um, the data production environment. And it may well be that curation services can't provide the storage or the, uh, you know, a, a, the, the storage or the discovery or the, the access to data that is very complex and specific and voluminous. And I will just give one example, which is that we have an institutional repository called Deep Blue at the University of Michigan that is you know, wanting to collect research data from faculty that go along with their publications or whatever. And that, that repository has a constraint to it, which is that no file bigger than, I think it's two gigabytes. They can only take two big gigabyte chunks of data. Well, I'm working with a software center in material science where we have 240 terabytes of storage, and we're just getting started, you know? So, you know, this, this kind of di disconnect is, is, is really important. And, you know, the idea of, well, let's go to the material scientists and tell them to take their 245 uh, terabytes of data and break it into however many, I can't even do the math in my head, <laughs> two gigabyte chunks. That is a non-starter. So, you know, we, we, we have to be attentive to what the technical requirements are if we're going to do anything than be foolish when we go out and offer services to, to the producer community. Um, we need methods to capture as much contextual information about the data as we, 
as we can. And by that, I mean, I think there's a real tendency to try to um, make the curation job easy by going to the lowest common denominator, um, standardizing and formalizing things that are not very amenable to standardization and formalization, and then throwing out all of the contextual information that the scientists have put together because that's what really helps them do their job. And to me, I'm not opposed to standards or guidelines, but I think we need to be much more flexible about what we're willing to take. In the SEED project, um, we said, you can give us data, we'll take data in any format. And we have, no, we, had the, we have no real requirements for what metadata comes with it. But we want to nudge you, you know, as it suits your purpose to um, become a little more standardized and to, it, and then we want to figure out what metadata that you're already making do we need to capture and just restructure in some way to make the data useful. Um, I'm going to move on here. Uh, we need to look at, um, so, so I think for understanding this production environment, we need to um, understand, we need to do some assessment of, you know, we, you have to have a certain amount of domain knowledge. You don't have to be you know, a uh, uh, biochemist to know something about, to learn something about bioinformatics, but you need to have a little bit of domain knowledge. You need to be conversant, um, and that takes time and exposure. It also, I think, for those of us in, um, in universities, means we've got to attract a lot more people with a lot more diverse undergraduate majors coming into this field because, you know, they can build on their scientific backgrounds. Um, technology, we need to, you know, and then understanding this technology workflow and standards and also the culture and values. Um, on the use and reuse side, we need to um, have a better sense of the demand for data. Our curation standards and practices have been driven by the supply. There's a lot of stuff out there. We don't know what to do with it. Everybody should have a data management plan. Everybody should share all their data. Um, no. I mean, we should be focusing on the data that we at least believe might be in high demand at some point in the future. And we need to understand the manipulation and interpretation and, and analysis requirements. Okay. Um, I'm going to kind of skip through, um, I think, this, this part. But there's, you know, it's really trying to f look at where does what a curator is doing fit into a larger ecology of data flows which include things like filters and selection and throwing a lot of things out and leaving them on the cutting floor and not losing sleep over it. Um, and then for the producers themselves, you know, clearly we do want to nudge data producers into uh, doing a little better job, making sure their data is secure. Um, and but we have to understand that the way to be effective there is really serving some scientific business or maybe even personal need. Like, I want to digitize my family photographs and I want to have fun doing it. So how do you do that without saying, no, you're not doing it right unless you're, you know, adding the birth date and the authorized name and the place where this photo was taken. You know, forget that non-starter, um, that it enhances the value of data. If it benefits current users in current time, then 
you know, you shouldn't have to be doing a sales job. And if you're doing a sales job, you're probably barking up the wrong tree, I think. Um, and, and we want to look for curation processes that are sort of natural and embedded in the way that people do work. And I think the best way for this to occur is that educating scientists or data producers about curation is best designed by people in that environment, for people in that environment, and obviously, you know, one, people who know a lot about curation have demands and requirements. You know, we need to have a little say in that, but the idea that we're gonna teach um, scientists to be curators and tell them it's good for them, I think that the, the, that the, the time for that, if there ever was one, has passed. Um, I will s quickly say that we also need um, education for users so that they, we, they have the ability to do a critical assessment of the qualities and limitations of data, that they don't just accept data on face value. Because without that, again, there's no amount of metadata or documentation that we can provide that will prevent people from misusing and misinterpreting the data. I mean, part of the, there, it, reusing data takes work. It takes work to understand it. And rather than saying, let's curate to such a high level that any person with any amount of knowledge can pick up this data and use it and do it well and accurately. I mean, the burden of that is phenomenal. So we have to have a certain amount of faith in users becoming more sophisticated and in the scientific community holding people who reuse data, holding their feet to the fire if they don't use it and interpret it well um, or accurately. And then I wanna make a special plea. We just need to know, learn a whole lot more about how people are discovering and reusing data. We assume that they have or they will and if we have more, there will be more reuse and then there will be, um, you know, better science and there's this pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. But we don't, we have very, very little empirical evidence that people who, the data that is in repositories is actually reused. And going along with that is a better set of uh, selection criteria so that we can um, actually uh, put our effort and, and interest into the data that is most valuable, most important, most critical, uh, as opposed to taking this limited amount of resource and spreading it across a bunch of mediocre stuff. Okay, just quickly, um, as I mentioned, the cost, the big cost is getting it from the, the producers to the repository. And right now, we kind of have a way of shifting costs back and forth, like let's get, the, let's get the data producers to make better data or add more metadata for us. And their thing is, I don't care about curation, so I'm gonna give you, and I don't care if it costs you a lot to deal with my data. Um, we need to figure out a way to reduce the cost overall. And we have to recognize that for that to happen, people in different roles are motivated by different factors and benefit differentially. So in conclusion, for us to really have scalable and affordable pro approaches to curation, they need to be highly automated, a second, something you don't even really give a second thought to and really become part of the culture and of, of the processes and culture of the producer community. And the communities that have made big investments and that have standards, bioinformatics is very interesting, for example, where there are a number of databases, there's high level of throughput, there are standards in place for new experiments, 
And it is second nature. And the next set of, of researchers coming in get trained in all of that. Well, we need to see more of that. But also recognize that some kinds of science are just not amenable to that kind of standardization. Um, we really have to provide demonstrable benefits whoops, to users. Sorry about that. Um, I'm, I mean, Um, and, and, and demonstrably add value. And then I think curators have to be prepared for the unexpected. I mean, I think we've been waiting for the moment when we'll get all of the producers trained well enough so the data will come in in the kinds of formats with the wonderful metadata exactly as we wanted it. Um, and then if it isn't like that, it's like, well, throw up our hands and, you know, what can we do? Um, there is going to be messiness. There's going to be uh, a lot of back and forth. And I think we need, you know, both a little more flexibility and a little more resilience. So you have the opportunity to get your hands on some of this stuff and um, approach it as a problem to be solved, not something, I guess, to run away from. So, thank you for listening. I think we have a few minutes for questions. And it's important to use the microphone, I've been told. So let's all thank Margaret for this nice talk. Thank you, Margaret. <laughs> it's nice to hear somebody sound so practical and reasonable when we think about all these horrible, messy problems we have to deal with every day. That's a, you probably saw a lot of heads shaking like, yes, we know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you very much. Um, we are going to have some time for questions. Uh, we have microphones on either side of the auditorium. So if you have a question, please just step up and say who you are and um, ask your question. And it's just important to speak into the phone because we are the microphone because we are recording this session. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, you can take the questions. I will take the questions. Hi, Bob. Thank you, Margaret. Um, uh, you could say who you are, I, and just I, probably most people know you, but. Some do. Um, I'm Bob Horton. Um, I'm assistant director for collections and archives at the Museum of American History. And my question is, have you seen any projects or, or uh, successes in, in the area of creating demand where curators have kind of actively gone out and uh, created audiences or helped to develop audiences for the, uh, the material, the, the data that they're uh, trying to preserve and make available? Um, that's a really good question. I, um, I, I guess I, I, I will say nothing pops into mind because I'm not sure how predictable the demand is, but um, I, I found it really fascinating uh, shortly after the election that all of a sudden there were scientists and librarians and students and archivists all over the place recognizing that danger that that data were threatened. And um, I think coming up with some very distributed and somewhat off the cuff criteria for what data should we rescue first. Now it will be interesting to see whether there is demand for any of that data. But what I, I think more importantly on the demand side, I would say, um, the one thing we know about demand for, for data is that if we look at repositories, if we look at data that has been deposited in some kind of repository, most of it is not used. The mean number of uses of a data set 
if you we just said across all deposited data sets that are accessible in the world that we know about, the mean is zero and the mode is somewhat less than one time, somewhere less than one time. And um, the data that is heavily used is a rare, rare, rare exception. So rather, I mean, where I'm coming from, actually right now I'm involved with um, uh, Carl Lugosi and our doctoral student, Jeremy York, trying to look at data that is cited in the data citation index. There's, there's four some million citations, uh, citations to four point some million data sets or data entities, I should say. Of those, only 200,000 have more than one citation. One can assume if they have one citation, it's probably by the original author. And there's only 20,000 that have more than 10, I think, something like that. So what is it that makes that data it's a real power law. So there's a very, very small number of data sets that constitute, you know, 95% of the reuse. And there's this very long tail that never gets used. So I think we need to understand why is that? It could be its time hasn't come yet. It could be, um, you know, there will be future demand, but we don't know that. We don't know much of anything about, it, writ large, about, about reuse. And I think until we can understand that, it's gonna be hard to develop good ways to promote reuse. Hi, I'm Kim Trika from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and I have a comment first and then a question. And the comment is, I really liked the sort of domains knowledge and curation knowledge. Um, but it also flashed me back about 15 years from when I was working at the University of Virginia with the digital humanists, because you essentially had the same thing, except the bottom was sort of like technological knowledge. And so they needed people to help them build a website, or they needed people to create searches, or do text markup, you know, or GIS. So it's just interesting that that applies so well in a slightly different way. Um, but the question sort of goes to a little bit, it could get into the reuse, but it's more about you, th there was a bullet point that you ignored on one of these slides, which was about um, formal selection. Uh -huh. And, you know, because that's to me exactly what doesn't occur, right? Everybody want, you know, there's that thing of it's electronic, we must save it. And so I'd be curious as to what you actually mean and, you know, at NIST, I'm wondering whether you could even call the, oh, it's been published. Is that, would that even qualify as formal selection? Because I think most of this is gonna fall into the category you were just discussing. It's gonna be this long tail, it gets published. And in a lot of cases, at least from my previous scientific background, what's probably gonna happen with a lot of it is it's redone better 20 years later. Exactly. So, um, I'm sorry I skipped over that, and I realized I had skipped over that toward the end. Um, I think probably the most critical, and, and I, I kind of tried to capture that in, in some other slide where I said we need to set priorities for what we are going to invest our curation resources and effort in. And an underlying piece of that is some kind of formal selection criteria. Now that formal selection criteria, in my view, has to be driven by people in the domain with domain knowledge. But when, you know, and I, I am, I'm not, well, I'm a bit of a critic of data management plans in the sense that they've had, in my view, unintended consequences. They haven't had their intended consequences, which is to say lots of good data is now flowing into repositories because for the last six years, researchers have been required to have a data management plan. 
And they've had unintended consequences, which is that people perhaps have the impression that any data they produce is worth managing. And this is where there's a disconnect with the formal selection criteria. And we take the finite resources we have, and rather than focusing them on data that where there's already an infrastructure in place, there are standards, there's a known demand, there's reuse possibilities, um, and we take all those resources and just spread them really thinly over, you know, depositing or sharing more of those data sets that have zero citations or training people to do good curation for data that's not worth curating. And I don't mean to offend anyone, but you know, we shouldn't be giving people overinflated ideas or having them worry unnecessarily about data that really has limited use. And I say that as a researcher, I have data. I mean, is it worth curating? I don't think so. You know, <laughs> and I could even do it on the side <laughs> myself. So there's, there's, you know, there's a real need there. But I don't. We're not going to be able to develop some universal selection criteria. I mean, I think that is something that, in, in science in particular, the scientific fields and disciplines really need to focus on. Now, the comeback is always. Well, we don't know for sure. Somebody might want it for something else at some point in the future. And that is because you can't predict the future. But that mentality, in my view, came out of a time when there was not much evolution in um, methodology, research methodology, and information was scarce. The p potential for substituting, I mean, look, look at what's happening. We're substituting tweets for unemployment statistics because they're leading indicators and unemployment's a trailing indicator. So, you know, uh, it's, and, and, and we're doing that right now in a very primitive way, but there's no reason to think that 10 years from now or 50 years from now, we won't have a lot more sophisticated things to, to, to do. And I, I have a certain amount of faith. I mean, and maybe this is a, my, my problem. But I have a certain amount of faith that um, the users will rise to the challenge of doing what they can with the data they have. And I guess I say this as a historian having heard people say things like, oh, wouldn't it be delightful for historians if we could just save everything? And the answer is no, it would not be delightful at all. <laughs> and it would make history really not fun to do anymore. In fact, it would be an utter nightmare. And so, you know, because part of our, part of our craft is taking what we have and making the most of it. And I think even, you know, scientists who have very high demands for precision and all of that, that's, that's what makes science interesting to me, anyway. Oh, oh we have one more question. Announce yourself, Jesse, please. Hi, Jesse Johnston from the NEH. Um, uh, just in response to Bob's question, a sort of thought that was occurring to me. Um, uh, this is, I think, spanning sort of digital preservation, digital curation space uh, in a way that you haven't talked about a lot. But um, in terms of the digital preservation of audiovisual materials, I'm thinking of the um, 
collections of native cultures uh, going back for a century, century and a half or so, some of which are here at the Smithsonian, Library of Congress, other major repositories around the US. The, the I think the digital curation activities uh, around some of those collections have enabled new uses and generated a lot of interesting reuses from repatriation to creation of new art. Um, you know, the restoration of the Curtis films and, you know, has kind of resulted in new performances and things. So that was just a thought that was sort of occurring to me. And I think there's a lot of other examples we could see, especially in the audiovisual preservation space. Mm -hmm. um, so that was just a quick comment. I do have a question, though, and you've really talked a lot about it in, in what you were just saying. But um, you mentioned the resource um, uh, constraint issue. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I wonder if you have anything else to kind of say about this point at which we might make a decision that some, some data isn't really worth continuing to invest resources in. Um, in what I do, which is relatively small in comparison to a lot of NSF data work, um, but there's a very limited amount of resources to go around, and that's a persistent question. And what you were just talking about indicates, I think, that once you've invested resources in something a single time, there's a lot more incentive to invest resources again, even if there's not a large use uh, that's apparent at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I just wonder if you have any kind of thoughts or examples or um, other sort of advice on that question, because I think there's a big resistance. Uh, it's sort of, you know, for example, with the data management plans, um, people never want to say that they're going to get rid of the data after five years. It could be part of the data management plan, but you never see it. Yeah. Um, so how do you make that choice, or do you have any examples to talk about? Um, I think one of the reasons that there is very limited resource for doing the kinds of things that you do uh, Jesse, in the humanities and in music preservation is because we have invested in infrastructure or we've invested in saving data that isn't being used. And you can't go back and turn back the clock. But I would think some guidance from the disciplines about which data are we really concerned about um, that is available for comment by other potential reusers would be really helpful. And that then translated into some guidance from the, the NIH, the National Science Foundation, whoever, that says, Saying that you're going to dis to dispose of your data, you know, you're not you're you're going to keep your data for five years after your project is over, just in case somebody has to verify something, that that is a perfectly acceptable data management plan. I know that at NSF the idea behind the data management plans was that the panel reviews would look at them. They weren't part of the merit criteria, but we, you would learn in the different disciplines what was important. I don't think that analysis has occurred. Um, I, my, my experience being on the few panels I've been on is that the data management plans get very little attention. And, um, you know, the idea of a consensus around what a good management plan is for biology or physics or social science, that is not coming out of this process yet. Whether it will or not, I think, remains to be seen. But, but you know, we've kind of taken a big supply problem that might have not a totally natural solution, but that people have applied their judgment to and said, for, you know, made decisions, this is not worth me investing time and effort in curating or sharing with anyone else. And, um, and we've just added fuel to the fire by saying, well, but somebody else, you know, we're second guessing you because somebody else might want it at some point later. Um, that 
that is not, to my mind, a sufficient justification to um, not deselect things. And I mean, we have to recognize what you preserve is the rare exception. It's, you know, and, and life has gone on. I mean, I know the National Archives used to say 3% of federal records. If it's 0.3%, I'd be really surprised. Um, but we've limped along. And if it were 100%, I don't know. We The capital would have sunk into the Potomac River by now, I think. I don't know. But, um, you know, that, to me, that the, 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 picking and choosing and being strategic about investments at lots of different levels is, it's just critical. It's absolutely critical. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, Margaret. Thanks, thanks to Aaron Rushing, too, for um, doing all the logistical Absolutely. support on this from the libraries. Thank you, Aaron. Just walked out the door. So, okay. Thanks, everybody, for coming.